I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> so um, I want to take you a little bit further back than you just heard, if I may, just so that you know who it is who's talking to you. I, I began, I, would s I, I, I grew up in a Church of England church in a village. That's very different to the villages, I understand. <laughs> I'm learning fast about Florida, a village in West Yorkshire in the north of England, a very small Victorian church of, I don't know, 100 people, probably only three families, no real peer group. Um, but my life was turned inside. I was, I was baptized there. I was confirmed there. Eventually, I was married all in that same church because my parents never moved. But my life was turned inside out in South Africa not far from where the Litzels currently work. And then after university, which was in Cambridge, I went on a Rotary scholarship. I bet there's some Rotarians here to the University of Minnesota, <laughs> where I first discovered a church that I really loved. Up till then, it felt like church was kind of what you did if you were a Christian. I discovered Messiah Episcopal Church in St. Paul, Minnesota, and if somebody doesn't cheer, I shall be really upset. <laughs> there may be a lot of people who know it, but there's one person over there who was in the congregation with me, Robin Morocle, yes! <laughs> so, and Robin and I have seen each other, I think, once since, maybe twice. Robin showed up for my consecration. I could not believe it, out of the blue. Just, she just came and prayed and smiled, and, and it was such a blessing. Anyhow, uh, so uh, Messiah was where I ended up working for that church. Uh, uh, I, guess, I guess I was a gopher. That's very Minnesotan to say a gopher, isn't it? <laughs> um, th there was a British rector who used to call me his dog's body. That didn't, go, <laughs> that didn't translate well in American language. Somebody said, are you his dead dog? <laughs> Anyway, sort of all-purpose, youth director, mission director. But for me, that was my apprenticeship in, in ministry and, I suppose, priesthood. But I then returned back to Britain to, uh, to train for ordination uh, at, at St. John's College, Durham, for those who are interested. For those who've got links with Trinity Ambridge, I was there with Justin Terry. Some of you will know him. It's a small world. Um, uh, and then I, uh, I, I have, I am, I think, one of the only bishops in the Church of England who has never been vicar or rector of a parish. <laughs> Shame on me, what do I know? Um, but I, I, I did a chaplaincy with undergraduates, then I became dean of one of the Cambridge colleges. Uh, then in the, in the vacation time, I managed to get my PhD which is in Old Testament, biblical studies, biblical theology. Um, and then I moved uh, slightly uh, sideways move in Cambridge terms to R Ridley Hall, which is another theological college. Anybody know Ridley Hall? There's the old American student blows in over there, which is wonderful. They would welcome more if you were interested. In fact, Anders was at Ridley Hall once upon a time too. We didn't coincide there. Uh, and... Um, I'm telling you my life history now. Is that okay? I wasn't kind of planning to do this. Okay. Um, where did I get to? Ridley Hall. And then out of the blue, we were so happy at Ridley Hall. We just had two, two ch tiny children. We were, uh, my husband is also ordained and a, uh, and a writer stroke priest scholar type, Sam Wells. Some of you might have come across. He's now written over 40 books, and I have not read them all, confession. <laughs> He writes them faster than I can read them. Anyway, um, we had two tiny children. It was a stupid, stupid time to move. But Duke University approached us sort of with a double header. We, I didn't know anybody at Duke. Why on earth? But anyway, they were quite um, persuasive. And it was around the time of the tsunami. And the Lord had said a word to me about the nations. And Sam was over, actually he was somewhere here in Florida, I think it was Orlando, for a, a conference of Christian ethics, that's his field. And um, they were after him to be dean of Duke Chapel. And he said, oh, Duke Chapel, what's that? Just, just go away, give me a break. 
But somebody at that conference who knew both of us said, you stop, you listen, you talk to God about it. Anyway, uh, he got hooked while he was over here. And then he, he said, I'm never going to persuade my wife. Never, ever, ever. I'm going to go home. You can pray for me all you like. But anyway, that following week, the Lord spoke to both of us simultaneously. That means at the same time, right? <laughs> but I, I just, sorry, I had to just think for a moment. But in different places through exactly the same words at morning prayer, the Lord sends you to the nations. My problem was that my vision of the nations was like, in the tsunami direction of countries. It wasn't North America. Now, I, I, I confess my prejudice when I say that, even though I've lived and loved life over here before. Anyway, the Lord called us to Duke, short story. And um, my role there, again, I was moving to a job that had not been invented. Um, the dean said we have a whole lot of Anglican students over here. Uh, this was pre-2005, when Anglican and Episcopal meant much the same thing, yeah? Uh, and they've never been very well served at Duke, but geez, do they have a good time and do they give a lot to shape what is a Methodist sort of seminary, essentially. And he said, we need, you know, your skills, you can round them up, you can create a proper kind of seminary within the Divinity School. For, for Episcopalians. The problem was I arrived just as all hell was breaking loose uh, in the Episcopal, am I allowed to say that? In the Episcopal world? Okay. So, uh, you know, believe me, I know some of the dynamics you have lived through at least from 2005 to 2012, seven years we were there at Duke. So I became director of what became the Anglican Episcopal House of Studies. We had students on both sides of the current divide um, I was passionate. I think I only got away with this as an outsider. You know, I, I said I was an Anglican and that wasn't a political statement at that time. Uh, that was the reality of who I was. But, um, you know, I said as long as we pray together and study together, you know, you can go and minister in diverse settings. Of course, diversity grew as the Anglican house grew because we ended up with two different parallel ecclesial structures, if you like, and there was an awful lot of pain out there. So I was receiving students from commissions on ministry and bishops who weren't quite sure what they were sending them to at Duke, except that I said, we are not taking sides on this one. Um, if, 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 if your candidate can get a place at Duke, which frankly wasn't easy, and I, I might add somehow find a way of paying the bills, which also isn't easy at a place like Duke, I will form them to be a priest uh, f that you are calling them, shaping them to be. And that proved to be a phenomenal process. We just, I, I, I just can't tell you how, you know, compared to f working, training, leadership for clergy in England, even at Ridley Hall, even people as brilliant as Anders. I can't tell you the quality of 20-somethings, young, able, whole career ahead of them, determined to work so hard for an MDiv. I mean, it was not an easy way to an MDiv at Duke, frankly. You don't have to play basketball to get an MDiv, by the way. Um, <laughs> But, but these folks were formed, as I, as I put it to bishops, whether ACNA or, or tech, these priests were being formed for a church that doesn't exist yet. And I remain committed to that church. So that's the place from which I'm coming to speak to you uh, these next three days. It's a real joy to, um, to wear my summer sandals <laughs> and a sleeveless shirt again. You know, in, in I, I, I live in leafy Surrey. It's very beautiful. It's, it's a sort of half an hour outside of London at, at sort of seven o'clock on the clock, roughly, yeah? Diocese of Guildford. Um, just to give you a picture of life there, 173 parishes, 83 schools, uh, about 300 clergy, about half of whom are stipendary. Do you use that word stipendary? You know what I mean, paid. Um, there are two bishops. I'm, I'm the suffragan bishop, so I have my freedom. I have the second chair. 
the diocesan bishop. Andrew Watson is, is the diocesan bishop. So I have all the fun, I have freedom, he gets all the problems. I push things on his desk that I don't fancy. <laughs> uh, I, I, I do education, I do training, I do vocations, that means ordinance and um, ordinations and all that stuff. Uh, and I get to flit around quite a lot doing things like this when invited. But it's a long time since I've been back in the States and I, well, it's pre, no, I've been once post-COVID, but I, I feel rusty, frankly, but it's really good to get out. And my new job, just to finish where Justin ended, wh is, so in January, I will be moving role to a, a role that hasn't been invented yet. It seems to be the story of my life. We, w we, we do a lot of sponsoring pioneer ministry in England, sort of you know, getting out of the old mold and uh, mold in a secular age to sort of reinvent church, and we call them pioneer ministers. So I'm now calling myself a pioneer bishop. Um, the new role has grown out of Lambeth, and, and I can't believe there's never been a role like this before, frankly, to continue to build the friendship and fellowship that, that grew, was so powerful at Lambeth. I think it was so powerful, partly because it was 14 years, not 10 years, even without COVID, it would have been a stressful period of time, not least given some of the, the tears in the fabric of the communion. But because of COVID, it was even more precious, even more rare, even more important. Uh, and I do think it was a huge, I think it was a game changer. I, I hope those are prophetic words and they'll only be true if we live into them. But it felt like that. And... Um, while I was there, conversations began about how to grow, you know, between Lambeths. And, and frankly, I don't know what Lambeth cost, but I'm not sure we can afford it every 10 years, frankly, in future. It cost a lot. So how do we, especially in a post-COVID sort of Zoom online world, how do we build friendship and fellowship across the cultural divides that will, that will keep us focused on Jesus? and enable us to function within uh, a single ecclesial structure, recognizing that unity is not about the absence of diversity, but it will involve working out what are the limits to diversity. Uh, and, and those I do not know yet, but you know, we can, well, we can talk about those the next few days if you want to. Okay, two more minutes on what we're going to do. Uh, in I have three sessions, two tomorrow and one on Wednesday morning. Um, Bishop Brewer told me you were exhausted. And I said, okay, does that mean you really would like to go lie on a beach in Barbados <laughs> for these three days? <laughs> I'm sorry. He, he, he wasn't offering that, but I was... <laughs> <laughs> I, I was pressing the question because I know what it is to feel exhausted. It's the, it's the VUCA uh, conversation, isn't it? Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. That, that's, what, that's a U.S. Army acronym. And that is what we as clergy have lived through at least during the past three years. So I, I'm not surprised you're exhausted. I'm exhausted too. But I put it to you that lying on a beach in Barbados is not going to help us address the deep challenges we have spiritually in the church. It, it, it may help you get to a place when you can begin to receive the challenges, but I want to... I, I, I want to help us, and I, I'm so talking to myself when I say this, plug in to God for two and a half days. Uh, and I, and I, you know, I, in the end, I'm, call me old-fashioned, but I believe God's word, when we dwell in it, it speaks to us, it feeds us, it nourishes us, it encourages us, it challenges us in all the places that you may need it. I don't know what they are. They will be different for each one of us. So what I've done is chosen a text that I think has all of those ingredients in it that I hope will encourage you, and I hope it will also challenge, and I hope it will feed you 
in order that you are the more resilient, the more resourced for functioning in a volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous world and church. Okay? That is Ephesians chapter 3. It's the prayer of St. Paul after he's cleared the throat. I mean, he starts praying in chapter 1 of Ephesians, and then he gets carried away talking about Jesus for some unknown reason. (laughs) And then eventually he comes back to the prayer in chapter 3, verse 14. So we're just going to look at seven verses. So we're going to go very slowly. I hope it won't be dull. I am a biblical scholar, but I promise it won't be dry. Okay, I I know when somebody's introduced with a PhD, what I used to think before I had one was, oh, they'll be so boring and dull. Oh, Lord have mercy. I hope I hope that won't be our story here. But I just I want to dig and I want to help you to dig. But I also want to encourage some some Lexio Divina, some dwelling in the word, listening to the wor- word. Come on now. <laughs> and so we're going to do, th- we're going to do it in three verse chunks. Verses four, t- this is chapter three, verses 14 to 17 tomorrow morning, verses 18 and 19 tomorrow afternoon, verses 20, 21, th- uh, what are we on? Wednesday morning. Is that right? And I just want to throw out a challenge before I finish. Uh, yeah, and if, if I were to divide those up, I think it would be closer, deeper, wider. All about Christ's love. Okay? Closer, deeper, wider, those three sessions. But I just want to throw out a challenge. I encourage you to go away at some point before tomorrow morning on your own. Well, you can do it with a buddy if you want. Read chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. I don't care what, what version, that's you know, completely up to you. And dwell in it. You know, just kind of, uh, this, this might not be the right expression, but it's the one that comes to mind. Kind of gargle with it. <laughs> yeah? Chew it. Mull. You know, let it marinate. Okay? Uh, and if, if you are up for this, I would love to encourage you before you leave to learn some of those verses by heart so that you will take them with you and when you are driving they will come to mind, when your, when your phone isn't working and there's no signal and you're swearing it'll come to mind, or when your axe throwing it might come to mind, <laughs> just whenever you, I just, I've worked in, oh I've missed out a few countries I've worked in, But South Sudan, I look forward to talking to Patrick, my goodness. Uh, When I was at Duke, actually the the big draw for me of going to Duke originally was they asked me to teach a visiting teacher program in South Sudan in my summer vacations. So that's actually kind of continuation of what I'll be doing in this new role, except that I'll be working with bishops rather than clergy, I think. But, But going back to South Sudan, Every single one of my students had been refugees during the war and had come back into South Sudan. I was going to say post-war. The war was still rumbling all over the place, but they'd come back. And I said, what did you come back with? And they said, nothing. Much as what they'd left with when they were mainly children traveling hundreds of miles together to find safety, so I said, you know, these, these were mature Christians. Granted, they hadn't had a formal education uh, uh, that, that, you know, credential, in a credentialed way. But my goodness, these people knew Jesus. And I said, so how do you grow to maturity when you've none of the normal resources around you? And they said... I think you will find most of us have learnt God's word and we carry it inside. And sure enough, you know, they, they wanted me to teach Hebrew. Why do you want, why do you want, I wasn't very good at Hebrew, I'm still not very good at Hebrew, but they wanted Hebrew. Why? Because they've been forced to learn Arabic. Arabic is a Semitic language, the same roots. It was a way of redeeming their Arabic by using what they knew to understand the Old Testament better. And they carried a version of the Old Testament, and certainly the new, in their heads. So there's a little challenge for you. We don't have to be as good at languages as they are. There's no hope. Don't even try. 
Most of them could speak 10 languages fluently, no sweat. But how about learning some scripture, just like you did when you were kids at VBS, yeah? All over again, uh, Ephesians 3, 14 to, 14 to 21. You don't have to learn all of it, but I just challenge you to learn two or three verses, okay? That's enough from me right now. I don't know who I'm handing over to. Great.